So when looking back at uh, test three, there's going to be test four, and in preparation for your final exam, one of the things you're going to face is choosing the correct, you know, hypothesis to test. That's going to be a big thing for us on this exam, and you'll be looking at all these different choices. Of course, test four, there was a much more limited selection of those choices. So let me get back here, and let's review some of these things. So it says listed below are the number of enrolled students in thousands and number of burglaries for random selected large colleges in recent year. Is there sufficient evidence to conclude there's a linear relationship? So the, the thing that can catch your attention here is this right here, linear relationship. Another way to say that would be a correlation or there's a line. So there's a couple equivalent ways you can test that. You can try and fit a linear regression, or you can just do a correlation test. Those two tests are the same, as I kind of noted up here. And you're testing whether or not rho is equal to zero versus rho is different than zero. So the correct answer is you're testing for a correlation on that one. Uh, so shout out to my son, who actually wrote up to Rite Aid for us and picked up a batch of M&Ms so he can do this one. Um, of course, you didn't have to follow through on the test. I gave you the expected values, expected percentages, and I asked you to see if they match the observed ones. Expected and observed, that refers to your goodness of fit test. So, um, now there's a couple ways you can state the null hypothesis that I would have accepted. The one that I wrote here is uh, relating to the probabilities. Those probabilities are given up here. So probability of a green is 0.16, et cetera, all the way up through probability of a red. I accept that. Or that you state that uh, the observed frequencies match the expected frequencies, and then the alternative would be that they don't. So there's a couple different ways you can do that, but that's a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Do your observed values match the expected values? Now, one thing that's easy to mix up with a chi-square goodness of fit test is a chi-squared test for association. They're both chi-squared tests, but they're testing much different things. In a chi-square test for association, we want to see if two things are independent. There was a lot of struggle with setting up the null alternative hypothesis on this one. What you're testing for is, are these things independent? It is... Whatever happens with one variable has nothing to do with what happens to the other variable. So, uh, is there sufficient evidence to disclaim the results from the test should be thrown out because they are discriminatory? Now, this is kind of subtle here. By saying that they're discriminatory, it means that one influences the other so that they're not independent. Of course, you, you have to start out with the assumption that they are independent, which would be the ethnicity and passing this test are independent, and the default is that they're associated. We'll get to that the second part of this, the cause and effect stuff later, but uh, you're either independent or associated. And of course, the correct choice in that one was D chi squared test for independence. So listed below are amounts of radiation found in baby teeth. The 5% significance level tests the claim that strontium-90 from Pennsylvania vary more than the amount from New York residents. I don't know if you recognize this, but I use basically the same data set for a question on your last test. Um, this time, though, what's the key word in this part, in, in number four? What should you notice the most? The word vary. Now, the word vary refers to a particular parameter, and that's your standard deviation, which measures how much variability there is in a data set. Uh, so there was only one that referred to that, and that's two population variance slash standard deviation. Weights of poplar trees were obtained from trees planted in a rich and moist region. 
Trees were given different treatments identified in the table below. Use a 5% significance level to test to claim that the four treatment categories yield poplar trees with the same mean weight. Did you recognize that we actually did this one in class? Yes. Okay. So I'm not like really trying to trick you. That should be an alpha, not an A. Um, but what you're testing is, are these the same in terms of the same mean? So it would be something like this. Um, overall, you guys did pretty good on this one, I think. Um, but there was, you know, there was a little bit of misunderstanding. The only test that you have in your arsenal right now to test more than two means is an analysis of variance. So if you're testing three or more means, it's pretty much pigeonholed into an ANOVA is kind of the, the brief acronym that people give to this. I always kind of like that one. Um, when you take higher level statistics courses, then you can start doing a multi-variable analysis of variance. And of course, that's abbreviated as a MANOVA, which, you know, again, kind of cool acronyms. Um, problem three or problem six here, I don't think many people had much problem with. It was just a matter of substituting in uh, the 6.327 into your equation. Uh, one thing that you do have to look up or you have to be attention to is that X is height in thousands of feet. And I gave you the X value. Uh, I also mentioned that, gee, this is 6,327 feet. That's how high it is. But as far as counting in thousands, there's your X value. Um, I think if you put in X equals 6,327, you would find that the temperature is really, really, really cold. In fact, colder than absolute zero. Problem number seven, there's actually four things there's actually five things that you could have listed. Um, I was kind of hoping for better on this one. Uh, we went over it that day when we talked about uh, causation. And then the next day, based on your feedback, which was really helpful, I listed these things again. I'm like, okay, just to be very clear, these are the five things that you should look for. If you did five, you got a bonus. Uh, if you did four, okay. You got full credit. Um, but these are the five things that I uh, listed, and that's all I was looking for is for you to list them again. Confounding variable. Boy, I got a lot of really interesting definitions for that one. Um, that was entertaining reading you over the weekend. Thank you. But confounding variable changes the relationship between a couple of variables. It confuses things. So you can't tell, gee, does smoking cause cancer, or is it this mysterious gene that the tobacco companies say exist that causes you to like cigarettes and causes you to get cancer? So that's a confounding variable. Um, give you another example here. Uh, weather, quite simply, is happening outside your window. That's what's happening right now. It's what the weatherman tells you is going to happen tomorrow. In contrast, Climate is long-term changes, and um, climate uh, is the average weather for a region. Climate changes with the latitude. Weather changes with the day. Uh, now, even though we didn't do all of these in class, I mean, a lot, they're all coming from the book, with I think maybe one or two exceptions. Um, birth control records of babies were obtained and categorized according to the day of the week they occurred babies are unfamiliar with our schedule of weekdays and weekends so a reasonable claim is that births occur on different days of the week with equal frequency so there's a, a couple ways you could state this one but if we're looking at equal frequency across many different days then that means each day has the same probability of success, which would be one seventh. You could also say the observed data match the expected data. That'd be a different way to say this, but it's going to be a chi square goodness of fit test. Um, I gave you the p value, so all you had to do was look at the alpha and reject, uh, and then state your conclusion carefully. By the way, it's interesting that um, uh, the weekends. 
not as many babies are born on the weekends. So part of that is because, you know, if you're going to schedule a C-section or something like that, then you need to schedule it uh, in advance, and, you know, they're just not working weekends. Okay. In kind of a similar way, uh, uh, there's a huge spike near, um, in fact, the, the week of the NCAA tournaments in basketball for men getting, you know, fixed, shall we politely say. So they, 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 they literally schedule their surgeries the week of the NCAA basketball tournament so they can just, you know, well, they got to stay at home and relax, you know, and recover. And there's a huge spike in the frequency of uh, such operations around the NCAA tournament. Okay. Um, you should know these. Um, you know, one or two of these was new, like correlation, etc. But in general, what we did a lot in this course was to calculate sample statistics and then test them against population parameters. You know, does the sample mean suggest that what we think about the population mean is true or false? What's the confidence interval for that? In general, it's tough to know the population parameter. So we surround it by a confidence interval. Um, your population parameters are, for the most part, Greek letters. Uh, let's see. Uh, this question here, friends asked you to explain R squared. You know, the amazing thing is that a lot of you guys got it right when it was on that in-class regression quiz. So on the in-class regression quiz, um, people got it right. But when it came to the test, uh, it didn't go so well. I would suggest that you know what R squared is. Basically, R squared is telling you how good a job your regression line is doing. R squared is between 0 and 100%. So 0 less than or equal to R squared, less than or equal to 100% is 1. So if you have an R squared of 1, that means your data lies completely on a straight line. If you have an R squared of 0, then it's completely random. And then, of course, you have everything in between. But it's telling you how good a job your data is your x value is in telling you what the y value is. Now in the case on the front of your in-class regression quiz, take a look at this line. Do the data lie pretty close around this line? What do you think, Jacob? Okay, so if if I gave you the x value, does that give you a rough idea what the y value would be? <coughs> yeah, well, yeah, but it, it's, it's pretty close. I mean, if I gave you x was 60, you'd be pretty close to knowing what the y value is. It certainly gives you a, a better ballpark of what the y value is. So the degree to which that happens, the degree to which knowing the x value helps you know something about the y value is what r squared is. It's telling you the proportion of this variability, the variability in y, that's explained by knowing the variability in x, or by knowing the value of x. So definitely of uh, the things on this test to know going in towards the final is an r squared, because that's how you're going to judge all your regressions. Not just the linear regressions we did here, but when you go beyond this course and do uh, uh, multiple regressions, R squared is still going to represent the same thing. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, So there's three different, um, 
three different methods by which you can quit and then you can uh, compare whether or not people were smoking or non-smoking after trying these things. It is a little bit tempting to try and do this with an analysis of variance because you get, well, you got three columns. But why isn't this an analysis of variance? Why is it something different? So at the 5% significance level, tests a claim that the method of quitting is independent of the rate of success. So the key word here is independent. So that's telling you it's a chi-squared test for association. Now the null hypothesis is that there's no association. There's just nothing. The alternative is that there is an association. We can't include we can't conclude anything beyond that there's an association or no association. That's it. So in this case, we got a very, very small p value, so we reject H naught and the method or the data support the claim uh, that um, support rejection of the claim that the method of quitting and the rate of success are independent. And that's it. You can't conclude anything beyond that. Now you guys did really good on this kind of like bonus problem. This is certainly one problem that wasn't on your ex or in your homework, but it's something that I was very happy to see you did well on. And that is you can't prove anything uh, in terms of a causal relationship with a chi-squared test for independence. The only thing that they can show is uh, an association. So in the case of Kristen Gilbert, there's an association between her working and patient deaths, but it's not proof. You can't conclude that she's guilty because there's no causation here. Uh, so you did really well on that, and I was very, very happy to see that. Okay, let's continue kind of working backwards. And uh, work with test three. Let me ask you a question. I, I gave you this little box here. Is that helpful? Do you like me to draw that box for you? Okay. All right. In a type 1 error and a type 2 error, when I ask you to describe it in words related to, um, related to the problem, what I'm looking for is for you to state what is true and what you concluded. That way you can see the, you know, the difference between the two, see that there's a contrast, and see that what's true is different than what you concluded, so that you've made an error. And of course, you have to describe that in the, in the correct way, but that's what I'm going to be looking for. Grading these things is, is not fun because you really got to dig down into what you're writing, but I do do so carefully. Um, you know, and this is an important part. This is something that gets a little more emphasis now that we're teaching this course with StatDisk and some software as opposed to, let's say, the graphing calculator. Uh, the emphasis is on correctly stating your conclusions in words so people can understand that. So more hypothesis test for test three. So back to the amount of radiation in teeth. This time we're testing the mean amount. If you're testing a mean amount for two different data sets or two different populations, then it's something like this. The only thing you have to decide is are these independent or matched pairs? So how can I tell the difference? What would it mean if they were matched pairs, or what would I have to see if they're matched pairs? Yeah, if they affect each other, okay? But presumably, how much radiation somebody has in their teeth in Pennsylvania is not going to have really anything to do with what's going on in New York. You know, um, now, if these were 
twins or husband and wife or you're measuring some person in the morning and some person in the evening, etc. That's the kind of situation that leads to a matched pair. But that's not what we have here. <clears throat> okay. Flipping over to problem three. Sample mean um, is 24.2, standard deviation of 14.1. So the thing that you're going to have to keep an eye on is, is how many samples have you drawn? Because sometimes you're going to be doing a two-sample test, sometimes you're going to be doing one sample test. But here it's uh, exactly one sample. And that, that sample mean and deviation were here. You're going to test this against uh, the claim that it came from a population with a mean of 25, and a, uh, you know, you know, mean of 25, period. So there's one sample, and you're testing a mean. So that's uh, just a one population mean. Um, proportion is what's next. Simple random sample. Uh, no, no, it's not proportion. It's another mean one. Okay. 19 green bananas. This is a little bit unusual. Usually math problems don't waste too many words, although this is a stat class, so you know, the 19 green M&Ms is kind of irrelevant. Uh, what matters is you're testing the mean weight and you have one sample. Down to problem number five. Pretty much says it all here. Testing the claim that the tar content of filtered 100 millimeter cigarettes has a standard deviation. So it's right there, and it's one population. So, again, that's pretty straightforward one population standard deviation or variance. Poll. Uh, 531 of 1,002 adults felt they were vulnerable to identity theft. Tessa claimed that the majority... Now, the majority happens when you're greater than 50%. So that's a population proportion. Uh, so, last page of these things. Um, so, study of the effectiveness of airbags. This is one sample. That is, number of occupants in car crashes with airbags. And then you have a different sample. Those without airbags. Now you're testing the claim that the fatality rate, that'd be the proportion of fatalities amongst those with airbags and those without airbags. So it's a proportion. You have two samples. So that'd be D, two population proportion. This one is matched pairs. Listed below are the number of words spoken by members of five different couples. Assume the numbers of spoken words is normally distributed. Test to claim that among the couples, males speak more than females. How come this is a matched pair as opposed to just a regular two population mean? Yeah, they're couples. They're in the same marriage. So, you know, one's going to be related to the other one. Wow, this guy's really chatty. <laughs> you can see the wife's there. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Just, all right. Um, let's see. So I gave you the confidence interval for the difference in IQ of those with lead levels and those without. One thing that you guys have been really good about this semester is not using the word probability. Probabilities don't have any place in discussing 
result of a confidence interval. If you really wanted to mention it in terms of probability, it's either a 0 or a 1. The confidence interval either contains your population parameter or it doesn't. We don't know which. But uh, as far as talking about it, you can be 95% confident, and that's really level of confidence in your procedure. 95% of the time, our procedure will contain the population parameter. Hmm. And the key thing about this is that that difference does not contain zero. So that is mu sub low minus mu sub high. If that were to equal zero, then mu sub low equals mu sub high. Just move that to the right side. So if that's the case, then you shouldn't be rejecting H naught. But because this confidence interval does not contain zero, then you should be rejecting H naught. So that was the conclusion on the bonus there. Yeah. Um, I think I stated to you during the exam that this reflected a 95% confidence interval. So, uh, yeah, right there. So it was an oversight of mine in writing the exam. I forgot to put that there. Uh, it's helpful for you when you're doing these tests and you actually have to look back and say, all right, how am I going to word my conclusion to write down the original claim? Um, in this case, I gave you the p-value, which helped you out. But what you're testing is a claim about variation uh, or standard deviation. So that would be a test on sigma. The p-value is really small, so we reject h naught. Remember, if p is low, h naught must go. And then the last one, which you had to do completely, was to put in this in stat disk. Uh, you're testing two different data sets. I had you do this one on stat disk. You had to pick the correct columns, columns one and three, out of that data set and test this claim. Um, so your null hypothesis is that is always going to include equality. Your alternative one won't. The p-value was essentially zero, so you reject, and then you look at your sheet to decide the correct wording of the conclusion. The correct wording depends on what the original claim is, if it contains equality or does not. So.